These aren't the stories your mother told you. No, these are the other stories. <laughs> <laughs> Today's episode of The Other Stories is The Blunt Edges, written by Dan Howarth and narrated by Josh Curran. You've heard of me before, haven't you? Come on, you. Tall guy. You've read Fortean Times. No? Well, you look the sort, is all I'm saying. Maybe you should consider it. Don't let this lad's sniggering put you off. It's full of scientific knowledge and indisputable facts about the supernatural. Maybe if you had read it, we wouldn't be here now, would we? Um, State my name. Uh, Very well. Dr. Bartholomew Rouse. You can refer to me as Doc or as Barty. (laughs) Oh, Dr. Rouse, is it? How formal. For the record, I'm a doctor of archaeology at the University of Suffolk. Suffolk, my boy. M.R. James country. Why do you think I'm tenured there? M.R. James. Man. Ghost stories. Good lord, I'm working with the dregs here, aren't I? Don't you have anyone else I can speak to? No? Uh, I see. Your tall colleague outside the door, perhaps? That man there. You're sure he isn't with you? I see. Um, To get back to it, my association with the unfortunate Professor Dyson began many years ago. All academics and researchers worth their salt know each other in this field. We're all publishing regularly. You need to stay up to speed on your competition and your colleagues. I read so many journals. It takes up an inordinate amount of time, but it's a vocation. I guess that what you do is a vocation of sorts? Hmm. Yes, thought as much. I met Professor Nancy Dyson at an academic conference at St. Andrew's University. Believe me, you can tell why they send the royals to places like that. I look back at it now with sadness, though. You see, that's when things changed. A few of us, Nancy included, grew tired of the usual conference fair. Not the food, goodness no, but the agendas and the workshops and the presentations all became a bit... samey. It's not that we knew it all, it's just that, for a while, there wasn't really anything of interest coming out from the early Middle Ages period that we all excel in. One of the others, Stevenson, up at Lancaster, suggested that the five of us create our own little breakout group. We met up in a quiet room in St. Andrews, all very nicely upholstered with mahogany bookcases. I asked him what he wanted this group to be for, and he said that we should dedicate our not inconsiderate talents to investigating folklore and cursed objects. That sort of thing. We are, or were, experts in our fields, and if anyone can debunk the myths and mysteries of this green and pleasant land, it would be us. Of course, a little bit of flattery didn't hurt, and neither did the quality of the sherry he managed to source. We got to talking then, referring to the good old days of university academia, back at the turn of the 20th century. Oh, what a time that would have been. No television, no internet, just a place where minds were eager to learn, and research would be conducted in dusty libraries or out in the field. Nowadays, most people watch a three-minute video about something on YouTube and think they have the right to an opinion. Naturally, from there, we talked about the old chit-chat society at Cambridge the way people of education would get together and entertain each other. It was there that M. R. James read his first ghost stories aloud. This was our inspiration. Admittedly, using my phone, I accessed the text of Oh, whistle and I'll come to you, my lad, and read it out to the hushed audience. From then on, it was set. We threw ourselves into this clandestine research, digging into the local myths and legends of where we lived or worked. We met quarterly, and those were honestly some of the best weekends of my life, preparing work that enraptured my audience, but also being inspired and challenged by what they produced. We grew close, all of us. I grew particularly fond of Nancy, Professor Dyson, yes. We challenged each other, and as far as I'm aware, enjoyed each other's company. It wasn't long before we were talking regularly on the phone or exchanging long emails. 
and at that point, I thought I had found my match. Finally. After all the years of searching, I thought she might be the one. An almost folkloric concept, I suppose. Around that time, three of the five of us made startling archaeological discoveries. Or at least I thought we did. It's then that it started to all fall apart. Stevenson, his find up in Morecambe Beach, was widely debunked by the group. What he did wasn't an honest mistake. He tried to pass off an 8th century text of Anglo-Saxon myths as something far older. I mean, none of us are stupid, not even him. He didn't take it well, and I fear I was too eager in my laughter at him. Of course, I didn't know about his and Nancy's relationship then, but I can see how people such as yourselves... It makes things complicated. Nancy's find was altogether more interesting. She'd found bones in the northern side of the All Saints churchyard in Manchester that belonged to a disgraced bishop. He'd been implicated in not only prostitution, but also the abortion of babies alleged to be his own. That the man had been cast out by the church and buried amongst murderers and suicides is fascinating enough, but that the church had covered it up drew national attention to Nancy's work. I was pleased for her. My find? Yes, well, that's a complicated one, isn't it? As you'll know, I found the axe. Yorick's axe. No, no, please, just let me explain. Isn't this why I'm here? To tell you what you need to know? Please, let me talk. Yorick was one of the last Viking kings of England, to put it in layman's terms. He wasn't king for very long. He died on the battlefield the same day he ascended to the throne. The previous incumbent died the day before. Rumour has it that a peasant, a woodcutter, hacked Yorick down and beheaded him with the same axe he used for his daily work. A king killed by a commoner. A king barely on the throne for a whole day. These were indignities that Yorick couldn't bear. His spirit and strength and spite inhabited the axe, giving unnatural power to the person using it. Power enough that they could quell their enemies in one strike. Could quell armies in one strike. Over time, the axe and myth surrounding it disappeared, until I managed to track it down through my work as part of the Black Mass Society. Droll little name, isn't it? Well, it, it, it was. After years of research, I found the thing in the marshlands of Suffolk. A true Jamesian story, would you believe it? It wasn't long after, things started to change for me. As though my luck dried up, if that makes any sense. So soon, after the exhilaration of pulling this relic from its secret burial place, everything went wrong. They were coincidental things at first. Despite my magnificent find, a younger, less experienced doctor rose to head of school ahead of me. This person didn't recognise my find as anything other than Hocus Pocus and Mumbo Jumbo. He was a Roman scholar and only put stock into finding artefacts from that period. Can I have a sip of water, please? Thank you, my throat's dry. Ah. People said I was stressed. I was anxious. Too right I was. Every day after finding that axe, I felt... followed. It started slowly at first. Just that occasional sense you sometimes get that someone's watching you. It gives you that odd feeling you can't shake off until you turn and look at whoever it is. Only I never could. I'd get it in museum corridors, or in the aisles of books in the library, when I knew damn well that I was the only person in there. After that, it progressed, or should I say, regressed. There'd be snatches of movement in the corners of my eyes. Shadows that flickered as I walked down streets or moved from room to room in my own home. I'd put it down to my vision failing, but the shadows were always the same. A thick, muscled arm. A squared shoulder. A face in profile. Strong nose and jaw, never looking directly at me, but always there. Of course, these things had an effect on my work. I couldn't concentrate, couldn't focus on anything but what was shifting beyond my vision. I could barely make it through a page without looking up or turning on another lamp. Final straw came... well, both final straws came together. 
During my early evening lecture, I know the students hate them, but they suit my timetable, I noticed a face that wasn't familiar. You can't know all your students, but you recognise them. This one, I didn't. He sat alone, right at the back of the room, in one of the patches beneath the room's projector, where the shadows are deeper. The most I could make out was his broad, hulking shape, with the only detail being the twisted, bent shape of his neck, as if someone had... Well, yes, exactly, as though he'd sustained a serious neck injury. After the lecture, I packed up and left the building on my own. However, walking down the lane that separates the campus from my digs, I heard a scuffling behind me. I turned and saw nothing at first, until I picked out the movement, black on black, someone moving in the shadows, someone bigger than me, bigger than any man I've ever known. I called out and got no reply bar the rustling of leaves. I couldn't do anything else. I ran, for my life. That isn't just an expression. I stole one glance as I pelted through the gate to my digs. A large man, a blackened, missing face, a twisted, broken neck, strong arms with dead, cold fingers reaching for me. I let myself in and locked the door. I was alone. I'd made it. Sweat dripped off me. Literally. I poured a nip of whiskey and took to my chair to read, to do something to settle my mind. That's when she phoned. Nancy. We'd planned to spend the weekend together, and I was planning to finally tell her how I felt about her. Perhaps we could start something more romantic than academic. After some platitudes, she cut me off. Barty, she said, I'm sorry, but there's something I need to tell you. I thought her mother had died or something. I instead, it was just something inside me that did. Graham and I, we're an item. We have been for a while. I've searched for a way to tell you about it. Things are moving quickly for us, and I'm afraid I won't be able to visit you this weekend. I hope we can still be friends, and that the five of us can still spend time together." Stevenson. Bloody Stevenson. All this time. Then I did something I'll regret. N no not what you pair think I've done, although I may have played a part. I sent the axe to Stevenson. That night had convinced me that the axe had cursed me. Could it curse him, too? Change my life back to how it had been? Maybe send Nancy running into my arms instead? I sent it to him first class. I'd barely received the email saying it had been delivered when I got a call from Nancy. Her screams, the thud of the impact, and the line going dead. She was never meant to receive the axe never meant to touch it, only him. I didn't kill her. Not directly. Not that that saves my soul. Wait, officer, no, I don't want to identify the weapon. I can't be in the same room as it. I will not, I cannot, please. Get me a lawyer, anything, just keep me away from it. Take it from the table, please. Thank you. It is Yurik's axe, but please remove it now. I need a moment, just two minutes alone to compose myself. Thank you. Officers? Officers, I asked you to leave me alone for a few minutes. Why is your colleague stood there? Officers, please move the big man away from the door, the one with the... Oh God, no, please, no! Officers, please come back, please, don't leave me alone with it. Officer Renshaw, collar number 8924, interview terminated at 1847. Suspect Dr. Bartholomew Rouse suffered cardiac arrest in interview room 4. Although paramedics were called to the scene, they were unable to revive him. After Officer Morrison and myself removed the axe and left the room, nobody entered, so Dr. Rouse's claims of an assailant remain just that. Claims. The investigations into the death of Dr. Rouse and his colleagues, Dr. Graham Stevenson and Dr. Nancy Dyson, are still open. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Other Stories. The Blunt Edges was written by Dan Howarth, narrated by Josh Curran, edited by Duncan Muggleton with music by Duncan Muggleton and Tom Robson, and sound effects provided by freesound.org. 
The episode illustration was provided by Luke Spooner of Carry On House. A quick thanks to our community managers Joshua Boucher and Jasmine Arch, and to Carolyn O'Brien for helping with our submission reading, and of course to Ben Errington for building award-winning content sandcastles on our big social media beach. Look, there he is now, playing volleyball. Go on, Ben. Dan Howarth is a writer from the north of England. His debut collection, Dark Missives, hit shelves in 2021, and he has several books due for release in 2022. Like all northerners, Dan enjoys heavy rain, pies, and drinking blood from the schools of his enemies. Josh Curran is a narrator and writer. He's narrated many episodes of The Other Stories over the show's lifetime. He's also the creator of the horror audio drama podcast, Miscreation. You can follow him on Twitter at at jcurrentwriter. The Other Stories is a production of Story Studio Hawk and Cleaver and is brought to you with a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. That means don't change it, don't sell it, but by all means share the hell out of it. So, until next time.